Pan, 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 p a r t three: Spheres of Life. Our key inquiry question: Sphere, sphere, sphere. What are the spheres of life? <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, so we need to start off with. If you haven't listened to part one of this episode, I suggest you go and do that. It's all very important. The background and life of Kierkegaard.、Um, so, in the end of that last section in part two, we did.、Uh, we said that the self is subjective for Kierkegaard. So, what does this mean? It means that life has to be lived out and acted through our freedom.、Uh, this is the crucial element of the subjectivity, at least subjective truth. Um, existence this is important. It's kind of a. It's what in mathematics it's called a sud. Have you heard of this? Yeah, you heard this word before. You nodding. You I've never heard of it before. Explain it to me. I'm doing this Socratically, ironically. Okay, so we're not just we can use that from now on. Every、yeah. time we don't know. <laughs> yeah, so a sud in mathematics is like a quantity that can't be expressed through numbers.、Uh, can you think of an example of one of these, Andy? Your mum.、Okay. Yeah. Right. We're glad we're taking this part seriously. It's pi,、yeah. right? So we we can't express pi through numbers. It's infinitely.、Uh, Goes on infinitely, so we use the symbol for pi. It's a sud. So for Kierkegaard, <laughs> I was thinking there was something along the lines of, "I like to eat pi when I'm with your mum." Okay, fantastic. <laughs> really, this is great.、Uh, for Kierkegaard, existence was all that was left once everything had been analysed away. So, although we agreed with Hegel to an extent, and perhaps we didn't do just that in that section, Hegel was massively influential on Kierkegaard. He rejected a great body of his work, especially the fundamentals. Hegel thought he could explain everything. Socrates thought otherwise.、Um, but once everything we can rationalize has been rationalized as temporal, rational, finite beings, we have to look at what's left. What's left is the self. This subjectivity,、um, which we need to f- use our own freedom to find what the subjective truth is, and this is the roots of existentialism. Yes, and in the first episode,、um, the quote "truth is subjectivity" was used, and I think a lot of people misinterpret that to think Kierkegaard just thinks everything's subjective, everything is relative,、uh, which is just an outright lie.、Um, he he fully、uh, embraced the idea of reason to do things like science and any type of inquiry like that. So he's not just saying like we can make up our own minds on everything. That's certainly not what he's getting at. So ordinarily, we identify. We've used the word objective and subjective a lot. Let's just use them how Kierkegaard used them. So he says, objective things、uh, depends on what's said, like history and science. You know, he's fine, like he just said, for them to be objective. But subjectivity is how a thing is said. There's certain something subjective about the self and how someone goes about and lives their life forwards, as Ollie said in the last part. And that that's the that's the important aspect for the spheres of life. This is really where existentialism and our whole theme over these three episodes, you know, how to live, how these people think you should live, is really going to come to life. So, should we just start off with spheres? Should we? So, there's three th- spheres of life. So the the aesthetic, the ethical, and the religious, and it can be interpreted as that these are kind of one step up from the next.、Um, so that you often people will start their life, particularly. Uh, in your teenage years, you might very much be living in the aesthetic,、uh, and then as you mature a bit, you may develop as a self and move on to the ethical. And the the final one is、uh, the religious life, which is really about taking、uh, a leap into the unknown, but ultimately, in well, for Kierkegaard anyway, a far more fulfilling、um, self. But We'll start off with the the two kind of big ones that would be focused on largely in existentialism, which is the aesthetic and the ethical. So he writes about the aesthetic and the ethical in his one of his first works called Either Or. So do you want to tell us a bit about this, Annie? The pseudonym that he writes under and yes,、yeah, sure. So、uh, we've already talked about the pseudonyms, and、uh, Either Or is a, a, an interesting one because、uh, the book is. Put together by an editor called、uh, Victor Eremita, who isn't. So I'm stressed right now. Is not an actual person. V- uh, Victor Eremita is already a pseudonym being used, and so this this imaginary person found finds an imaginary manuscript、uh, with two different 
people uh, and he he puts them into person a who is the the aesthetic and then uh, b who is the uh, ethical or um, but b does have a, a proper name which is judge william or judge wilhelm um, so you have all of these pseudonyms at play um, and even with the aesthetic there's lots of um, different elements in into that particular section of the book particularly a, a diary which is the uh, diary of the sedu- sedu- uh, seductor or seducer and the seducer's diary is kind of its own piece you can buy that as a separate book um, within and that's only a, that's a section of a section of the book um, it's worth stressing that either or is a very large book with lots and lots of ideas being thrown around so the first character so it's split into two parts you say one's written by just a the other one's written by b who's judge william yeah um so one the first part of the book expresses the aesthetic life and the second the ethical life mm-hmm. should we talk a little bit about the first half the aesthetic life the aesthetic life the aesthetic life is uh, essentially hedonism. We've talked about that uh, quite a bit when we were doing uh, utilitarianism. And the the basic idea of the aesthetic life is you live fundamentally for yourself. You're going from place to place uh, and trying to gain as much happiness and pleasure as you can do out of situations. And Kierkegaard talks about how boredom is essentially the enemy of the aesthete or aesthete, uh, and that people will do anything they can do as to escape boredom. Um, and, well, you can already imagine what type of things people might do to escape boredom. So in the in A, in the first part of either or, it, the person's talking, it's quite a young person. Uh, it seems they're, they're talking a lot about uh, love and how, it, not talking about marriage and how they wouldn't want to marry. It's pleasure seeking. It's, you find something that grasps your attention. So this person love and you find some other end to fulfill your life. But it's not really you choosing these. Um, this part, marry or regret it, don't marry or regret it. Hang yourself, you'll regret it. Don't hang yourself, you'll regret it. It's not what you're, Op- your opinions are but how you live these opinions um, you can see a lot of Christian this is a main part of his work and we'll look at this in the analysis and discussion is how he completely rejected the Dutch church he was completely against you know the Christian dumb he was all for Christians but not the institution I think later he writes something like if the Dutch church found out today that the in- that Jesus Christ was a fraud the car- the priests would carry on living their happy lives and the church would go on as it was the church is not for the people or for christianity and in fact faith is something really subjective and important we'll get onto that in a second but he was against the idea that if you're baptized if you're following the rules of christianity that you're living some kind of you know spiritual life in fact you could be a christian but on the inside you're purely living the aesthetic life you could be a doctor and living the aesthetic life living for yourself and he said you could be trying to cure disease, for example, but really that's just for your own ends, your own money, your own family's money. You might think you're doing it for your wife, but really relationships are often quite, you know, for, for you, they're quite hedonistic and your career is quite hedonistic. The things you do for your family, they can be. The aesthetic life's very much like this. Yeah, and this definitely reflects that kind of, if we're looking at, like youth and the idea of immediate satisfaction for what you're doing i mean this kind of i mean i kind of feel like it's already been said but even you could translate this to other things like even i mean if you're looking at more contemporary examples like people you know uh, taking drugs or people you know um pursuing lives which are yeah completely focused on their own pleasure and, and happiness um that's just kind of a very common behavior of young people i think and I think, yeah, like Jack said, you've definitely got this reaction against the Danish church, which I guess, which would have been very restrictive and oppressive of people and their behavior and what they can do. And that it shouldn't be about seeking pleasure. It should be about serving the church. Well, Kierkegaard's actually turning around and saying, well, no, actually, there is something to be said for the happiness you can get from from seeking that, that hedonism. He writes about it like it's a very youthful thing. It's an hmm. experimental stage. You know, people... You'll often hear them say, oh, I experimented in my university days or something like this. They're following the pleasures that they only so long as pleasured them. But Kierkegaard, you know, he lived that way himself as a student. I said he was smoking cigars, entertaining his friends, being sarcastic. I'm sure we've all, we've all done <laughs> we've things. All been there. We've all been <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah. You, everyone at some stage is either, you know, you might be playing video games or watching a binge watching films and then you might think, oh, actually, I might work hard on this essay. Oh, now I might start jogging for a while. I'm thinking of 
playing tennis now Wimbledon's on I'm kind of up for that oh wait no now I need to get married and have children because that's what society tells me you need to do and this is the this is the real kicker the aesthetic life you're not exerting your freedom onto the world you're not using your will and making yourself this subjective thing you are in a way this absolute thing in that all the input you're receiving is defining you of who you are if you're the kind of person that just wants to do well in school, get married, have children, and this isn't your own will, this isn't the will of you as a person, but the will of the people around you, you're living the aesthetic life. And as Ollie said, Kierkegaard, he looks at this in a very, you know, he expects people to be of a certain education to grasp this, but people taking drugs and uh, just drinking lots of alcohol, these hedonistic people, they fall into the aesthetic life too because they're just pe pleasure seekers who were just finding this temporary experimental pleasure and doing it for their own gain. Could I just read a quick quote here because it sums up really nicely with some of the things you were saying there. Um, the person with an aesthetic worldview tends to accept passively the life that was given to him by the random forces of chance or destiny that also determine his nationality, country of birth, race, religion, family and social identity. And that's what's really important. The, the, the person who lives the aesthetic lifestyle, um, as Jack was saying, ultimately they don't have a real self a sense of self they they do whatever the group are doing they kind of make decisions based on that's what i should do uh you know it's i and i can speak for myself you know i don't think i've really felt like i chose to go to university that was just very much here's the thing that young people do i should go do that too and half the things you do at university are to that same vein i'll go out clubbing because that's what a university student does uh i'll you drink lots the because... idea of you clubbing <laughs> exactly right because i realize i don't shows. really do that because it's not it's not what i enjoy that much um so what well, you don't like the... going out clubbing don't you I had this image of you as this amazing kind of philosophical raver. Oh, I was. <laughs> but then I awoke. And, <laughs> and the, and yeah, it's interesting. How many people m must do this? Um, kind of going and we'll, when we start talking about sickness unto death later, uh, w this, I sense that you just go with the flow and that people could live their lives in this situation maybe their entire life they won't ever think like why am i actually doing this they'll just do it oh yeah some, absolutely i mean yeah if you were going to sum up the aesthetic life for me yeah, it is kind of the definition of going with the flow just do what the people around you are doing um and yeah you will probably end up living a very i guess normal in inverted commas i don't really like that word a very kind of standard life yeah kirk would agree that standard it's normal but he really he's fighting against this and the reason why Andy has left his clubbing days behind him, and thank God too, because, wow. Um, <laughs> those, <laughs> those shirts. <laughs> the, the thing is, as you've just said, Ollie, it's going with the flow. If you could sum up the aesthetic life, I'd say it's going with the flow. So why would someone leave the aesthetic life? What, what's the... Because it's not their flow. Good. So it, it leads to despair. This is it's important. Part. And there's a lot. He, he's wrote a lot about despair. Kierkegaard. So let's just take it at face value. Despair being this this uh, friction between the absolute and the subjective. In a sense, you have this. Uh, you'll realise if you think about it long enough. Kierkegaard thinks if anyone actually sits down and thinks, you know, am I living the aesthetic life? And everyone listening to this podcast now will surely be asking the same question of themselves: Are you living the subjective life? Are you just going with the flow, the aesthetic life? Sorry, you're just going with what everyone's telling you to do, and you haven't exerted your own will onto your own existence. Then you're living the aesthetic life. And once you've realised this, there's no escape. And I'm really sorry, I've just done this to you. But you're gonna. If the more you think about it, you're gonna. It'll lead you to despair. This is not your existence. This is not your subjective existence. You're a cog. So Kierkegaard says you need to take possession of your existence. The will out of the abyss for Kierkegaard is to will deeply and sincerely. So you have to live through this anguish and this despair, accept the facts that you're living the aesthetic life and you need to move forward and he uses this imagery of escalation of these and although you've said you can treat them as different spheres and one goes after the other, it is a sense progressing to what, what is the ethical life. Yeah, I think what's important to note with that is that um, 
you can still enjoy some of the things of the aesthetic life when if you were living in the the ethical life i think it's just about which which one occupies your thoughts and your actions the most so if you're living ethically you you can still enjoy going down to the pub for a pint and and all of that stuff but that's not who you are um and it certainly means that you've made some sort of choice in that i i'm going to be this type of person um, which is really at the core of existentialism we were ragging a little bit, or a lot, on the idea of the aesthetic life, that it's somebody who passively floats through their existence, never making any real choices, basically a bit of a bum. Um, and the, but that's to sell the aesthetic life a little bit short, because you can be a refined aesthetic, um, in that, somebody who makes a, an actual conscious choice to live in, in the sort of highest way possible, in that aesthetic sphere so maybe that that could be somebody um just think of a modern example maybe somebody who dedicates themselves to to possibly a life of philosophy or poetry um but is still doing it for the reason of gaining happiness um and it is to be said that people who often do this or at least at the time of kierkegaard um would be very selective with their their friendship groups maybe there's almost like an element of uh sort of i want to say kind of eliteness to it Sobery. yeah uh, i think a little bit and that's something that kirkgaard perhaps even took part in a little bit in his own life uh, at the beginning and then moved away from it uh, so it's not some this doesn't always mean that you're you're passive you can choose the aesthetic life and i actually think um when we start looking at people like camus or sartre is that maybe there's ultimately nothing wrong with that but for kierkegaard being that he was a christian there certainly is something quite wrong with it so what's meant by the the uh the ethical life so we've just done the aesthetic life i said the reason was was because you need to take possession of your existence for kierkegaard you need to will deeply and sincerely, and you need to do that and progress upwards to the ethical life. So what's this? Uh, again, I'll just, there's a quite a nice little quote here that summarizes this up perfectly. The individual who lives the ethical life creates himself by his choice, and self-creation becomes the goal of his existence. Um, and this right there is is exactly what we were saying about existentialism. You, you're making a clear choice to, to move into what you deem to be the most important way of life for yourself. So as we were saying, the, the reason for moving forward, the ethical life encapsulates this. So you're exerting your own will onto the world and you're willing deeply and sincerely. Uh, subjectivity is the absolute here and the foremost task is choosing yourself. Um, so when in the, in the actual book, either or, Judge William writes a letter it seems to person A and in the letter he's trying to transfer what the ethical life will give him. It will give you marriage, and ultimately that's much more fulfilling than just this short-term experimental uh, young love that you seem to be feeling. And the character really seems to have that at the foremost of his, his reason for living that life. So you get to know and change yourself freely and improve on what you learn about yourself. And this is the whole idea of becoming the ideal self, the subjective person rather than being a person who's the consequence of the outside world so you're no longer a contingent thing and by that i mean contingent you know you're the person yourself the subjective self does no longer rely on all the things around you you don't go to university just because someone told you to you don't get married just because it's the norm and society tells you to you express the universal in yourself and you enter into a world of categories like good and evil and duty and what i mean by that is you become a necessary being which is freely chosen to live in these categories which are ethical so you no longer just go for the experimental short term or not necessarily even short term the things you do for themselves you enter into a world of necessities which are like good and evil and you freely choose to exert the choice onto the good side so you start doing what you you think you ought to do and yeah there's 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 a lot here in terms of ethics that we've looked at already yeah so we've looked at things like uh, utilitarianism and situation ethics and we've looked at kantian ethics um, so, you know, if we're looking at Kierkegaard, I mean, Kierkegaard's going to say that, you know, it's your, ch there's a big focus for him on the individual's choices, what they choose to do. So if you're living the aesthetic life, you might be from a Christian family and you're Christian and you follow kind of Christian ethics because that's what your family does. But for 
Kierkegaard, he's going to say that you actually need to think more honestly with yourself about what your personal individual ethics are and either, you know, I guess either come up with your own system or apply it to an existing system. So, you know, if you were born into a Christian family and you decide, actually, you know, you know what, I'm really into this act utilitarianism. I think that's a bit more up my street. I do think that all, I do think pushpin is as good as uh, poetry. You know what, I think all happiness is equal. That's you taking control of your ethics, taking control of your decision making and choosing to do that. You People around you might not even heard of act utilitarianism. They might think Jeremy who, um, but you know, that's your personal decision. And I am think, well, I'm, my, what I'm taking from this is Kierkegaard is saying that everyone needs to be doing this mm-hmm. and being truly honest with themselves, not just doing what the people around them do, but actually thinking and deeply considering what their personal ethics are. Do they believe that, I don't know, um, human life has value? Do they believe that everybody's equal? Do they believe that happiness is something that can be measured? These are questions that I think uh, Kierkegaard wants people to ask and kind of think about what their, their individual ethics are. Good. Uh, just as you were saying that, Ollie, I just wrote down what you said, what I take from this. And at the end where you said, Kierkegaard wants you to ask the questions and answer the questions. Again, this is Kierkegaard. He's not writing from, this isn't Kierkegaard saying these are the three spheres of life. You need to do this, that and the other. Kierkegaard is, is taking the Socratic irony and writing under the pseudonyms. None of these express his views. And that's the great thing about Kierkegaard. He wants you to start questioning your life. He wants you to think, Maybe I'm doing that. Maybe I should, you know, think about this a bit more. He's trying to get you to engage in what's, what philosophy is founded upon. And that's questioning everything. Find yourself again, use the same analogy. You, you stripped off and naked in the middle of the desert. You're no longer surrounded by everything you thought was true or everything you take for granted. You need to start questioning absolutely everything about your life, your existence. And this is something he was extremely frustrated with. Again, the ethical life, you were just saying, Ollie, you could be living the life of a Christian born and baptized into the church, and you could never ever actually freely choose to live the ethical life. And this is something which is massively important for Christianity. You have to be the one to do it. You have to freely give your heart to God, or you have to freely decide who you are relatively. And that's something which you can't do in the aesthetic life alone. Yeah, I think... Uh, as mentioned earlier, the, the ast- living the ethical life does not mean that you give up everything about the aesthetic life. And, uh, Judge William, when he's talking about the benefits or the, the kind of the reasons why marriage should be embraced is because he thinks that actually all of the sensual pleasures and everything that you get out of the aesthetic life are actually enhanced with marriage. Uh, that you don't just have these fleeting one-off, uh, meetings and relationships with these people and then never see them again actually to to embrace real love uh, is to actually dedicate time uh, and take almost take a risk in that uh, you're, you're committing to this one person and through that you'll you'll benefit and the, all the good stuff about the aesthetic life will actually be become better through living in this way if Kierkegaard is saying we should move from the aesthetic to the ethical life and a lot well, most scholars think he is even though he's playing the role of the Socratic ironist it commits what Hume, we spoke about David Hume, the Azort fallacy. I don't think we've mentioned this before. Mm, maybe we've referenced it. So David, David Hume, uh, it's now known as the naturalistic fallacy. He said, we can't derive an ought from an is. An is from an ought? We've, yeah, we've so definitely have, before. Yeah, so, yeah we definitely have. Yeah. So the, the idea is that just the way, because something is a particular way doesn't mean you ought to live that way. Um, they get to use a lot of the time when we're talking about things that are like, oh, that's unnatural. And um, it's like, well, okay, so like, even if we, even if we declared it is unnatural, does that mean that you have to live by that standard? Well, who says? Um, yeah. That's really the idea. And he commits the fallacy. So if Kierkegaard is saying that he commits the naturalistic fallacy because he assumes it's better for one, that the ethical life is better than the aesthetic life. Although I'm sure we all agree it probably is. And you listening, you probably think, well, that's just, that's just common sense. The ethical life seems to be better, more ethical. It's called the ethical life after all. But even if it was the case, it's not what we ought to do. Uh, but again, this is Kierkegaard trying to get you to think about this. It's not him saying, this is the way things are. This is what you ought to do. Progress through these three stages. It's him saying, where do you fit in this? Question yourself and really try and exert your own will onto your own existence. It's the spirit of existentialism. Yeah. And I think. For me, anyway, when we were talking about the basic idea of the aesthetic life, it's really hard to respect someone who lives that way because they 
haven't made choices. They have essentially, they haven't become an adult. They're, they're living a life completely at the benefit of other people as well. Because if other people don't kind of allow them to act in this way, uh, then they can't benefit. And, uh, yeah, I, I I find it hard to, particularly if someone was still in their 30s and 40s living this way, you would be asking questions of them. Is it worth saying, though, that the majority of people would, well, or I don't know, I'm not quite sure, that's why I'm asking the question, but wouldn't a lot of people say, well, actually, you know, even if I do consult this ethical life, the aesthetic life, all my all my decisions are the same because the aesthetic life is just more comfortable to me it's more i'm aware of you know i've looked at buddhism i've looked at hinduism i've looked at islam i've looked at judaism but you know what i'm familiar with christianity and i've been raised christian i don't know that that ethical system makes more sense to me i think as long as you make a choice yeah if you say right i was brought up as a christian um i thought about it a lot i've looked at other things and i think yes actually this is for me great um i mean obviously the fundamental thing i think we're <laughs> likely all to disagree with with kierkegaard is um do we need to make this leap of faith to christianity well i think we <laughs> if you've been listening to the podcast for the however many hours we've been talking the answer is to that is of course, no yes we'll get onto that stage in a second we'll save that for the next sphere uh, but yeah the the point is on your question like you have to will deeply and sincerely it has to be your will you know there's no it's it's what he calls it's one of the stages of angst which we'll get onto it in, in later on but that stage of angst is is denial denial that you're in the aesthetic sphere and perhaps denial that you're still in the ethical sphere because there's a reason for leaving the ethical sphere so essentially we'll get we'll pick up on this and the the real motive but you're always going to be living elements of the aesthetic life when you're in the ethical sphere. And you can never truly live the full ethical life because of that. And you need to transcend that for a very important reason. Should we, just as we finish off this section, interestingly, either or sounds like a choice between what, Ollie? One or the other. Yeah, and w- w- which two? Sorry, what are we talking about? One or the other Oh, or sorry, what? the aesthetic life or the um, ethical life. Yeah. Good. Uh, uh, but interestingly... Either or is not a choice about that at all. It's actually either the aesthetic or the ethical or the religious life. Um, so he presents these two ideas of ways of life, but actually at the end of the entire book, there's a passage from uh, a anonymous uh, priest, I think it is. I'll check if it is a priest in a second. Um, and he gives this sermon about uh, essentially why both are not not good enough and i've got just the one tiny line from that which will be nice just to finish off on the edification which lies in the fact that in the relation to god we are always in the wrong and that no matter which one we've chosen there uh either the aesthetic or the ethical life uh we're we're still wrong Uh, and i think that's that's very important to kirkegaard the religious sphere. This is the third sphere. Andy, you've read. This is the book I referenced uh, in the first part, where I said, you know, you were reading Kierkegaard from the day I met you. You were reading Fear and Trembling by Kierkegaard, and this is where we can find the religious sphere. Do you want to tell us a bit about the book? Essentially, a small book review. Sure. Uh, yeah. The interestingly, with Fear and Trembling, is one of the ones I think most people pick up because it's. I'm assuming at this point the most published one out of the entire lot. Um, in fact, Kierkegaard even wrote himself that he suspected that uh, if there was one thing that he would be remembered for, uh, that Fear and Trembling would in fact be that. Um, so the, in, the entire title of the book is Fear and Trembling, a dialectical lyric. And really what it, it's exploring here is that, uh, I might as well preface it, this with the fact that again this is not Kierkegaard uh, there is another pseudonym to this uh, Johannes de Salentio uh, and he is putting forward a view of what he believes faith to be now it's not made clear as to whether or not uh, Johannes here is actually a Christian uh, particularly in the sense that um, that Kierkegaard might say is a true Christian but what he is doing is presenting here's what I think faith actually is and really the whole thing is built around the story of uh, abraham and isaac and really what that means for the for the ethical life and we have just talked about the ethical life a bit and really the core to this book is the idea that uh, there might be something that can transcend the ethical so if the a question is asked uh, is there can there be a teleological suspension uh, of the ethical now if if somebody says that as a long term we might as well unpack that a bit 
now? If somebody says a teleological suspension of the ethical, what do you think that might mean? So, well, what's what does teleology mean again? Purpose, so that everything's moving towards a purpose created by God. Right. So there might be a, like an end or purpose. So, and if you're if you're putting a suspension on the ethical, what are we saying? You're not being ethical. Right. So you're suspending the ethical. You're you're stopping being ethical for the end purpose of perhaps something greater. And that's really what's important here is that uh, you can live an ethical life uh, in in Copenhagen as many of the people presumably did. Um, but if to be to live a true life of faith uh, means that sometimes you may have to do something which for other people might seem to be extreme. So Kierkegaard talks about this old man who from a childhood he was reading the story of Abraham and Isaac and he read the story loads and loads when he was a kid and as he grew older the story became even more fascinating for him and he couldn't quite work out what was going on in the story and we really think this was Kierkegaard himself who was stuck on the story as a child because this is so it's massively important to the move from the ethical to the religious sphere so for this we need to move to Bible Corner with Mr. Oliver Marley. Bible. 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 Corner. Okay, so we're not actually doing a passage from the Bible today on Bible Corner. Socratically, ironically. Um, we were. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> Is that Socratic? <laughs> Everything's Socratic irony now. <laughs> um, we're actually going to. I'm just going to talk about the story of Abraham and Isaac. Um, so, I mean, this is probably one of the, one of the oldest stories. I'm going to go with ever, I think. I mean, it's up there. Um, so the story of Abraham and Isaac is not just a story that's in Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Um, it's a story um, that goes back thousands and thousands of years. Um, so I'm just going to kind of uh, explain what the story is, and then we'll kind of look at the significance and how it connects to Kierkegaard. Where is the story out of interest? What, the geographical location? No, where is the story in terms of reference in a book? So it's in the Bible, it's in the Quran, and it's in the Torah. And specifically the book of Genesis in the Bible is, I yeah. guess, the one we're referencing. Yeah. Long ago, in a distant land, there lived a man named Abram. Abram was a Hebrew, and a very loyal Hebrew at that. He's very important in Genesis especially, and in the Old Testament, because he's one of the first people to make a covenant with God. Now, a covenant is a deal. So Abram made a deal with God, and that's when he became known as Abraham, um, that we may be familiar with. God made a promise to Abraham that if Abraham and his family followed God's instructions, that uh, they would be rewarded, that their descendants would number the stars, and that they would be um, blessed by him. This is important because Abraham was 99 when he made this or had this conversation with God, and obviously was pretty uh, surprised by um, obviously the promise but the promise came true Abraham and his wife Sarah had children um, including uh, a boy named Isaac um, now it's very important that we realize that Abraham his entire life was based around caring for Isaac Isaac was his, um, his his joy he absolutely adored Isaac and effectively you've got to think of it from the point of view that Isaac is the most important thing in Abraham's life Isaac and God and obviously his family are extremely important to Abraham. Now, one day, uh, Abraham has a dream um, in which God speaks to him and tells, well, effectively gives him a, uh, a command um, like he's done before. God asks Abraham to take Isaac um, to a sp specific place. Um, modern scholars think that this would be now uh, the Temple Mount um, in Jerusalem and sacrifice Isaac to kill his son to please God. Now at this time sacrifice was actually quite a common thing people used to sacrifice animals towards God all the time um, but people was something quite different especially in um, Judaism or, he or, or with the Hebrews human sacrifice was seen as a big no-no um, a big taboo something you shouldn't do but because Abraham is loyal to God he does he takes Isaac to um, the, the mount um, and is fully prepared so he's going to murder his son through uh through stabbing him and this is again we've got to kind of clarify really important that he's killing the most important thing in his life and he doesn't want to do it he regularly asks if he if he can't do it or if there's something else he can do but that's the rules of the game he's, he's got to do it um he is about to stab isaac so isaac's kind of uh kind of uh 
just about to be murdered, and uh, God actually intervenes and stops stops Abraham killing Isaac. He uses an angel which comes to Abraham and tells him to stop, and that he's effectively his faith has been tested by God to see his how loyal he would be, um, and he's passed that test. He's passed that test of loyalty, and instead, instead of sacrificing Isaac, um, they offer an animal sacrifice instead. So normally a, a sheep or a goat is kind of used in the story. So that's the the story of Abraham and Isaac. Emmanuel Kant, someone that Ollie referenced earlier and we've done an episode on already, said after reading this story that what Abraham was to do to Isaac was morally wrong. Interestingly, the story of the old man who Kierkegaard portrays as reading the story over and over again during his life, he's insinuating that the old man is wiser than Kant because he's he's pondering the story and he sees there's something more to the story than just an unethical act of a madman. What do we think of this story? Do, do we think there was something unethical there? Or do you think there's an important lesson to be learned? This is a really fascinating story. I think for me personally, I, I wouldn't be able to escape the, the whole notion of did he actually speak to God? Was this message a true message? And Kierkegaard fully accepts that. He knows that for most people, this is entirely absurd to follow something that you know is entirely unethical uh, to kill your your son you've been waiting years to have and uh, you've been promised descendants for for abraham had he had he fully doubted himself and believed that god would not be able to bring back isaac then he wouldn't really have faith at all he would be questioning the message and probably would have turned back on it and said screw it we'll just live our lives and see how how that turns out but he doesn't do that he fully commits to the act yeah i mean it's, it's effectively i mean it can be you know, interpreted in many ways but the, the basic message of the story is that faith is stronger than ethics or should be stronger than ethics from a from a from a jewish and from a christian from a muslim point of view um that your faith in god and in doing whatever is required of you is more important to you than anything more important than your only son more important than than anything you can conceive and it should come first that faith that unquestioning um belief in following god's commands to you um it's quite interesting as well because obviously we've taken the story out of context but obviously in within the context of the old testament not everyone that god tells to do something does it um and you know the history between god and the covenants is a, a pretty much god make they make a promise they break a promise they make a promise they break a promise um you know, not to kind of say that, but, you know, personally for me, in terms of my interpretation of it, I think if someone came up to me and said, Ollie, I've had a dream where I should kill my son because God told me to, I think majority of people in the modern day would say, that's just morally yeah. wrong. But that's ex exactly why he uses the example. Yeah. It yeah. is incredibly difficult for anyone to come to terms with being okay with Abraham. Um, but what, why he uses it in particular is because it's the type of message that gets talked about in church uh, on regular occasions saying, holding this man up, Abraham, as the father of faith. But if Abraham was around today and tried to do exactly the same act, people would be appalled. So there's a double standard about like what faith actually means for Kierkegaard. I want to pick up on this point in a second that you've just raised there, but it's important that we fully flesh out the, the religious life here. So Abraham was doing something unethical, and this is the big jump here from moving from the ethical to religious. Faith for Kierkegaard is the ultimate subjective act. It's a, it's irrational to do what he was going to do to Isaac. We can see that here in our own reactions of it. And it's beyond all possible justification what he's going to do to him. It's got nothing to do with ethics or good behavior. But this is the, this is the positive thing about the leap of faith that Abraham took was going to take. The ethical life with its notion of self-creation and responsible choice is unable to accommodate this leap of faith. And faith relates the individual to something higher, which is the essence of everything ethical so it's necessary to spend our ethical standards so we can transcend them and fulfill this idea of deeper purpose if you're living the ethical life you can't transcend that and you're going to be you need to this is all Kierkegaard's point we're finite temporal beings that don't understand everything we can't rationalize everything and there is something better there's something more um you know to escape the angst it's better for us to put our faith in God and put our faith in this thing and make that leap than there is just to live the ethical life.
as Andy was saying, their dialectic lyric is the subtitle to Fear and Trembling, which is kind of a, a contradiction in itself. It's kind of like a logical poem. So it's something irrational and there's something, he loves this paradoxical way of thinking, Kierkegaard. Paradox is okay. We're, again, we're just temporal beings and making the leap of faith towards God is the only escape we have to attain something higher. Yeah. And he's going to say that obviously to fulfill your telos, Going back to what Andy was saying earlier, you know, sometimes you will be required maybe to do things that you don't think are ethical or that would go against your kind of um, ethical sphere of judgment. Um, I mean, I struggling to think of an example. Maybe? I think it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting. For me, as I said, I would find it difficult to suspend the ethical for the namesake of religion. But, but then that's because I've made a choice not to accept religion. But I think it, what you've, if you're a, if you're a secularist and you're sat there thinking like, what on earth is Kierkegaard talking about? Surely this could justify any, say, like, terrorist who has put their faith in God telling them that this is what they should do and that they could carry out any name of the act because it transcends the ethical. Um, well, I don't think he would go that far. But if you put yourself into the point of view, I think, so remember, we're, uh, we're looking at a society where everybody is just kind of Christian by default, uh, haven't really made any choices. Um, and that uh, linking it into the Hegelian ethics is that, that it's all about how the society at the time or the highest society at the time is the kind of the pinnacle and that you have to live by the, the laws of the land and the, like everybody should be held accountable under this kind of grand ethics. For Kierkegaard, there's that kind of risk of, well, where does, where does it become the issue where you might have want to speak above the crowd, go, go the opposite way and maybe realize that what everybody thinks is right perhaps isn't right and i think if you, if you phrase it that way in your mind there must be times where people could be living in a society their entire life and see that the way things are shouldn't be the way things are um and that might be like well just think the gay marriage was only made legal <laughs> incredibly recently there might have been a lot of people years and years and years ago who would want to stand up and say actually i think this is the way it should be that would technically be transcending the ethical in that particular society i think one of the major themes of the story as well is that sacrifice is something necessary to achieving something isn't it so in terms of abraham sacrificing isaac we must sacrifice our rationality so we can we can go beyond that um sacrifice is often irrational and we lose notions of right and wrong when we do it whenever you sacrifice something remember his father himself in Kirkard's own words died so he may become something the sacrifice in god's plan of his father so Kirkard could go on and and do this work and inspire us today to be talking about this it's it goes beyond that just on the point we both raised again this is something listeners as well will be thinking what's to stop me waking up tomorrow with the dream that God has told me to sacrifice, you know, you, you both. And he says, pretend we're having a podcast recording tomorrow and this recording went wrong and I'm going to murder you both here. And that God says to do that. Well, it's just, a really, just don't publish it online. <laughs> I should gave away the plan now. <laughs> I just make sure this recording goes. The God of the Bible, uh, Old Testament, the New Old Testament. Testament. Yeah. And, and of the Quran and this story, he's, he interacts with people at that time he's a god that's always interacting with the world giving moses tablets you know speaking to people in form angels speaking to people he's very imminent very right? imminent and transcendent god of today to, today god doesn't do that he's not he's not someone who actually gets as involved so for someone to claim they've had this kind of dream or to have this experience abraham's someone who's interacted with god before and is someone who's he was at the time where God is getting involved. That's not the case now. So I don't think Kierkegaard thinks he, that he's aware that that was the period where God sent his son down to earth, his incarnation of himself. So he, I don't think he would buy it. He's still got that rationality to him. He's still got the skepticism, which we express in episodes on religious experience. He's not, he's not dim witted. He's, he's fully aware that those were the times where God was around. So, well, God was getting involved. So I think that in the, in this case, it's a special exception. He's one of God's chosen people who we interacted with. Yeah, I think that's it's wise, isn't it? That he's not going to accept anybody who blindly says that I've had a divine revelation and that I'm going to do said thing. Because 
to to accept that quite quickly probably means you haven't thought about it a whole lot. That's for certain. Should I? Uh, could I just quickly because I think we're probably moving on to the next bit, but just to finish off the stuff on the religious life, um, the importance uh, for Kierkegaard as we've said quite a few times at this point, is that ev- so everybody everybody around him, or at least most people around him, are kind of re- religious by birth. Uh, they live in a, the Danish society where you are born into Christendom. And there's a distinction to be made for Kierkegaard for Christendom and Christianity, or Christendom and a Christian. Um, and the faith for him, it needs to be this choice. And while it might be a paradoxical choice, it's a choice nonetheless. A lot of people around him, he would have felt, are just kind of accepting it for what it is, maybe not even in embracing any form of prayer or sacrament. But even if they are, um, they might be living an incredibly comfortable life. They, there's no friction or uh, doubt in their mind. It's just, I'm a Christian. Yeah. And he, he very much disliked or grew to dislike um, some of the leading bishops in the uh, the Danish church because of this very reason. I mean, yeah, you could see it as a bit of more of an extension about of um, the Reformation, right? So that was when people decided that the, the Catholic church was too powerful. It had too much influence, too much money, um, and it was really missing the core message of Christianity. And that's where several specific Christians, you know, decided to take that back. Um, and you can maybe see Kierkegaard as kind of like an extension of that, of actually saying, actually, no, Danish church, you're not in control of what Jesus taught. I am. And again, coming back to the very individualistic, individual person making their own decisions, thinking about the teachings of Jesus for themselves and not just blindly accepting, you know, the rituals of a church. You know, just because you go to mass on a Sunday doesn't mean you're a good person if the rest of the week, you know, you're doing acts that might not be so christian exactly and he even has a disdain for theologians um people who read the gospel and don't quite like how raw the message actually is so they write tons and tons and tons about the interpretation of what these gospels actually are supposed to mean and that really in essence all they're doing is is creating a distance between the message and what they want the message to be uh, and he even likens it to the idea of uh, a young sort of child putting padding down their trousers to avoid a spanking <laughs> uh, the, the your it's the because obviously the the message of the gospel is hard if you want to be like jesus it requires a lot of work and there are basically people a lot of christians throughout history have done whatever they can do to escape that reality good he uses an example of two men at prayer one man praying to the true conception of god the christian god and but he's doing it out of full spirit the kind of thing ollie was just saying and the second is a pagan praying to a primitive idol but with entire passion for the infinite and he's done it he's exerted his will and he's willed truly and deeply and he says the second man has the greatest subjective truth because he prays in he's his prayer is in truth. So it, you can't, there's no good being a Christian, like you say, being born into Christendom and living the life. And you meet people today who say, I say to people all the time, are, are you religious? And they say, yes, I'm Catholic. I say, are you, I, I didn't know that. And they say, yes, I've been baptized. And then Kierkegaard wants to grab these people by the collar and chuck them around and say, look, think for yourself, exert your own will. What are you doing? Like this is your love. For God and that leap of faith has to be your subjective will. And that's, you're going, you're living the aesthetic life or maybe a bit of the ethical, but you need to move beyond that. There's something irrational about faith. And that's, that's, that's the whole thing. Get past your finite limits and really embrace. Yeah. I'm that leap. Really looking forward to part four where we get to actually discuss yeah. maybe some of the limitations of we why will. someone who's quite alternative is very kind of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Christianity. the, the last, last thing I'll say about Soren's view on, on Christianity is that ultimately what he sees Christianity as is, um, Jesus and that you have to follow the instruction that Jesus put down because there is only one thing that really matters that like the, the moment of the incarnation of, G- of Jesus as God and that, uh, he, he makes the case that for, people at the time of jesus it would have been just as hard uh, to have faith than it is now and the reason because of this is that jesus was ultimately offensive um you you just picture yourself right now if if you walked out into a street and a man with a big long beard came to you and said sort of i am the truth and the way come follow me and you will have eternal life 
what is your reaction to that? It is largely just, who is this crazy nutter? I'm going to go and do whatever it is that I was going to do. There's no way that you would accept that. But at the time, that's what Jesus was. He was just a man for the, all of those people around there. And you either accepted in full faith that this was in fact the son of God, or you didn't. And that if you can't, if you couldn't answer that question truthfully right now and said, if Jesus was to appear to me, uh, and uh, without me knowing that this was Jesus and he, and he just said to me, like, follow my teachings, follow my way. If you couldn't say yes, then for Kierkegaard, you you can't really be a true Christian. Again, this could be pure Socratic irony again, and it's under a pseudonym. So we don't really know what it well, is. So, sorry, the bit I'm talking about there is not, so that's not. Oh, found not, in, yeah. Uh, okay. So I was linking back to the whole religious sphere sure, again. Okay. And perhaps the, the, all this writing in fear and trembling and in either or, he's just him showing Regina how much he was suffering at the time. Cause he, this is, feels very autobiographical and the Socratic irony there is deep. Just on a couple of things, just before we leave the religious sphere. On the terms of the church, he wrote towards the end of his life, he uh, put the rest of his money. We didn't mention this earlier in his life. When his father passed away, he probably had 20 years to live off the money of his inheritance, and he dedicated that to writing philosophical works, even though he didn't consider himself a philosopher. Even though his money was coming to the end, he had the choice to become a priest. You know, he could start working for the church. As we've seen, he wasn't favorable with this idea. But he chose instead to write his own magazine called The Moment. Have you heard of this? Mm -hmm. So the sole contributor and editor was yeah. Kierkegaard, yeah. and he used The Moment to attack the, the, the Dutch church. Yeah, so it re references his attack on Christendom. This made him massively unpopular, but not as unpopular as another episode he had with another one of the Copenhagen's magazines. Uh, yeah, so the Corsair was a s satirical magazine. It's hard when I was reading up about this whether or not to get a sense of it. it was more like like Heat magazine where it yeah, was a ridicules local like, personalities, ce like celebrity gossip, where it just kind of picks at the the worst of like the dregs of uh, kind of <laughs> journalism, uh, or if it was a bit more highbrow. But either way, the purpose of it was is that it would find um, quite public figures and it would tear them down a bit and people obviously like that type of thing so it became quite a popular magazine and at some point during Kierkegaard's life he decided that the best situation was to uh they were praising his work at, at the time they, they were they, they were being very generous to Kierkegaard actually um they they hadn't really taken any offense to him um I think he had a bit of an edge to him so they 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 quite liked that however he he wrote in and essentially said that um well at least his feelings were that if you if you weren't being uh, torn down by the corsair then it probably meant that you weren't that important a quote in the letter he wrote he put one is insulted by being praised in such a paper exactly because if you're being praised they probably they're not they don't think of you as being that important they tear down the important people um so for some reason, he decides that he's going to write into them and say, essentially, do your worst with me. <laughs> and they do. Uh, they spend, I think it's an entire year, like really regularly posting mostly images, but occasionally, um, criticizing his negative work. Characters. Yeah. There's criticisms of his work. There's, uh, they make, they like, call on his appearance. Yeah. They, so they, they rip apart his appearance. We've already said he was a bit of a hunchback. Um, they reveal and, all of his pseudonyms. Sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Know, yeah, all yeah. of his work. It's all Kierkegaard's now. Now everyone knows they've torn him apart. Yeah, sounds familiar. And and, um, and that he, well, interestingly though, he kind of rides it out. Um, don't, I mean, he, don't get me wrong; he was very depressed during this time. Um, and one of the things that he he found that he couldn't do is he used to enjoy while he was d doing most of his writing that he would go outside, he walk the streets of Copenhagen, and he would kind of have these ch uh, chats with random strangers almost uh, just just for the fun of conversation uh, he used to call him uh, call these walks his people bath uh, where he would <laughs> <laughs> soak up the, uh, the 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 common people in 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 Copenhagen and then he would go back and do his writing Give children presents and um, stuff as well yeah he, he seemed to be like he, like stuff. this is the warm side of Kierkegaard he actually he like he did like people it's just he was also a very intensely uh, introverted figure at the same time um but after the Corsair had, had their way with him, like he would literally walk the streets and children would make fun of him. People would be calling him names and he, he stopped being able to go out. So he used to take carriages uh, further out of the city just so he could walk because he, he couldn't be in public without everyone knowing who he was. Um, to the point now where even 
it, today in Denmark, the, the name Soren is not as popular as it once was. Uh, and, and it's assumed it's because <laughs> through all of this, the, the tearing apart of Kierkegaard uh, made it that way. For a long time, he did actively go out in the streets, like you say, didn't they? Another quote from here. One hires the Corsair to make abuse, just as one hires an organ grinder to make music. So he actively did, you know, he wanted to poke the bear. And there's so many reasons for him doing this. And he was just talking about how Christ, you know, if someone came, we'd do the big, big beard. Do we, Jesus have a beard? I, I just kind of caricatured there. <laughs> probably. But just in his jeans. Why not? <laughs> yeah, the big white <laughs> beard. First century Palestine probably yeah. had a beard. Yeah. So someone said that. And he, as he, Jesus was ridiculed and thought of as a crazy person. So, so too was Kierkegaard. Some scholars think that he wanted to walk in the shoes of Christ just as he walks the, his father's study to, you know, experience these things. He wanted to really feel what it was like to become a Christian. He wanted to sacrifice himself, perhaps like Isaac was going to be sacrificed by Abraham. He wanted to feel that. Or Jesus. Himself. Well, yeah, that's the thing. It is the reason why we've looked at Socrates as well, not only because uh, obviously Kierkegaard took a, a liking to him, but he he sees uh, in, a, in a particular way that Socrates and Christ are quite similar in that they were both kind of uh, quite antagonistic towards the idea of the truth and both essentially were sacrificed um, for for what they would try to do. They were riling up the public. Socrates was killed for, uh, what was it, like influencing the youth. Yeah, for um, corrupting the youth. Cor- corrupting the youth. Rejecting the gods yeah. of the city. So, I mean, he essentially, I mean, I guess he wasn't sacrificed in quite the same way as Christ, but he essentially was. Socrates mm. decided to kill himself because he, he felt like uh, he had to live by the rules of Athens, but he did he have much of a choice there? Probably not. Yeah, and these people were saying very revolutionary things as well. You know, I mean, Jesus is a person. I mean, there's often a very kind of uh, whitewashed, kind of pacifist kind of uh, perception of Jesus that's put forward. But, you know, there's lots of passages in the New Testament of Jesus talking about the reversal of the social order. The first will be last and the last will be first, which is pretty much promoting the idea that only poor people will go to heaven. Very strong rejection of the idea of kind of property and money and the elite um, in his time. Same thing with Socrates and same thing with Kierkegaard, really. Yeah, there's definitely a huge sacrifice there. He's a man who, who like you say, would, uh, I think this was off the microphone and he's telling us he would go to plays and he'd turn up halfway through at the intervals, even though he was writing, just so he looked at those. He's big on his appearance still. He had elements of the aesthetic life within him as he was living the ethical life. Perhaps this was his way to plunge himself into the Abrahamic, Abrahamic way. Um, or maybe it was all again just showing Regina how much she was suffering. Maybe all of this was a big romantic ploy. Love, he was a man of, I think it was love is really, he writes a lot about love. Love is the way to God. He says a lot about this way. It's not just faith in his other works. Um, or as Pascal, another theistic philosopher put, the heart has its reasons of which reason knows nothing. So our attempts yeah. to sit around these microphones and reason why Kierkegaard did this, it flies in the face of the Kierkegaardian spirit, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, we, we ultimately don't know. And there might be quite a lot of things to be said about his relationship with Regine. I think at this point in his life, while he, he still would have thought about her regularly, um, I think his decision to kind of attack the Corsair might run a little bit deeper than that. But ultimately, we, we can't possibly say. God damn it, the pants I cast have exposed to me that I am living the ascetic life. This dread is inescapable. The abyss is swallowing me up. My parents are going to be so mad. Perhaps if I listen next week everything will be okay. Maybe the guys will tell me that they were just being Socratically ironic and that they weren't actually trying to get me to question my life choices. Or my lack of life choices for that matter. Or maybe they were. Ugh, all I know is I need to subscribe on iTunes. I think. I don't know. I know that I know nothing. I know that I know nothing. I know that I know nothing. I don't know. I know that I know nothing. 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 I know that.